The passage of time. We have shared your joy at the birth of your children, and proudly we have watched them grow. We've taken care of your health care needs during the good times and the not so good. Your parents and grandparents have depended upon us. Together we have shared the struggles and the wonders of life. At Octibaha County Hospital, we are celebrating 30 years of being your lifelong choice in health care. We have one more person that would like to make a public appearance. I did not see her request when I slammed the gavel down. Good afternoon or well, good evening. Right? My name is Ventrice Reeves and I am a resident of Greta Lane and I see that you have something on the agenda concerning Greta Lane and I just wanted to get a better understanding because all that the residents on Greta Lane have heard is what we've seen on the news. Nobody from the city, nobody from the airport, FAA, you know, has said anything concerning that and they are speaking about literally picking my house up and moving it and nobody said a word to any of us and I just am trying to get a feel for what is going on. I understand and I don't think anybody's going to be out there tomorrow or the next day. The well next I understand that but just the idea. pick your house up. I understand that. And there is a problem. We've had our attorney to research that. Uh, we will be going into executive session to uh, <coughs> determine the airport and its needs and other issues that are associated with that. We will come out of executive session after that. And I think that uh, there will be some direction in regard to uh, what uh, uh, will happen with Red Lane. Mm -hmm. And like I said, you know, of course, again, going by the news reports, this is something that has been well, in the, the process for two just, uh, years. Well, the news media just loves it. may or may not be, you know, I understand it may or may not be so, but if it's something that has been going on that long and nothing has been said, I just, that that concerns me. It really does. And I just wanted to you know, make my statement anyway. I else. understand. And we appreciate you being concerned. Some of the rest of us are kind of concerned about mm -hmm. that as well and that uh, we should have some additional meet, uh, information forthcoming towards the end of the, of the meeting tonight. If you would like to wait around to, to hear some of that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Do we Thank have you. some other, other folks that would like to speak at this point? All right, we will move along with our agenda. Uh, we're down to board business, I believe. Let me double check that. Yeah, seems like it. And we have a request to approve to accept the bid for the North Runway Improvement Project. And who's going to speak for half the airport? You going to do that? Okay. This is a request to approve, request approved to accept the bid for the North Runway Improvement Project. Uh, but now correct that, Mayor. Yes. Uh, that is the taxiway and extension of the ramp. Taxi. Taxiway and extension of the ramp. I'm Ernest Russell. I'm vice chairman of the airport board. Uh, the chairman, uh, Tom Stennis, is uh, is in. Uh, is in Moss Point having his children who are having problems down there. So, so this came as a rush. <laughs> now, we have recently we have we have been we have been trying for years to get monies to change the position of a of a taxiway that's on the north side of the field. Uh, the, it is as it is situated right now. The taxiway is too close is too near the runway, the takeoff runway, or the runway. So it's got to be moved according to the FAA. And uh, they have, uh, we have applied for, and they have, they have awarded us funds in the, in the amount of $1.818 million to do that and to extend the ramp on the other side. Now, this is contingent upon your signing the uh, the, the, the agreement, and it needs to be signed fairly soon. Now, the so that uh, what this will do is this will give us the, this will give us some money to change to to actually to move to move the taxiway where it's supposed to be. Now, that's for instrument purposes. The uh, 
the, it is, and, and in terms of instrument approaches, the other taxiway was too close, too near the runway. And so this is a necessary. This is a, just a movement. It's, it's of the just runway. moving it. It's just moving it. And they will tear up the old taxiway and move this new taxiway further away from the runway. Do all of you understand what we're requesting an approval for bidding for this? And do you have the bids uh, came the in? Bids, the bids in, yes. And how much were they? Uh, the, 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 the low bid was one point nine six eight million from Ellis Construction Company. Oh, All right, thank you. And uh, it uh, so so it uh, so we will we so we need to they they've given us this much money, but they need they they they've sent the approval and you have it. Okay. Uh, uh, Ms. May, may I ask Dr. Yes, Russell a, sure. a question? You said that we had a grant of approximately $1.81 $1 million, uh, and I'm assuming to go with that is some local share, or is that a 100% grant? That uh, is. In other words, where do we make up the difference between that and the 1.9? That bothers me, too. <laughs> oh. uh, the, uh, the, we have another problem, too. Uh, the... Uh, the uh, but uh, this, the, the problem, we have a problem in that they think that we have $240,000, as I see it, and I have to check with, with our manager here, in our, in our restricted fund at the airport. Well, that $240,000 was contingent upon, I understand, is this correct, Lynn? Settled the land. That it's contingent upon the, uh, the, uh, the city. Uh, uh, giving us the money for the seven acres that they took. Uh, we that, gave it back to you. Right. So there, there right. is no right. There is no funds. Yeah. In there right. So there's been no money transfer there. Okay. So we have so so Mr. Stennis and I will go and and uh, and and uh, our airport manager will go to see the FAA and and clear this up with them. But they need to have this. Uh, we we need to we can. We'll have to see about this when it, uh, when y'all approve it in San Francisco. You may be looking at about uh, eighty-five thousand dollars. You might come up with in your budget committee somewhere. And it looks like the difference is about one hundred and fifty thousand. It's a bit. Yeah. Um, is there any way to <coughs> talk them into the bid? I mean, of a uh, hundred eight thousand, hundred. Uh, I think they gave us a about. I think, I think they gave us about all they could give us. I see. Time. You got some alternates there, and I, since I'm not familiar with what the alternates are, I mean, there may be something in there that can be yeah. um, left out without totally losing the. Uh, you probably familiar with what the alternates yeah. are. Yes, we we have um, we have we we will we will. Uh, Rodney, right, come up here. You know, he's he's the one who's been doing it. The base bid is for the new North Taxiway. The alternate one is more ramp area for parking the airplanes. There was not enough money for alternate two, and not enough money for alternate three. We started this with a 1.1 million. After the contractors all bid, they turned out, it turned out that the 1.8 is what was available from the FAA in Jackson. And the way I understand it is uh, the total project, 95% is paid by the FAA, 2.5% is paid by the state, and 5% is paid by the city. No, 2.5% the city, 2.5% the state, 95% federal. <coughs> so it, it could be that so we, we're needing we're, more than 150,000 because we have to come up with 2.5 percent of this 1.8 million. Another 45,000 dollars. So we're up to two hundred thousand dollars. If we, it sounds like, if I understand correctly, if we accept this bid to do this work, 
then it would obligate the city to help subsidize this or contribute to this, or is there airport operations that? You have the county, the university, it's, as well as the city, that one would think that all would participate in that. But it's a 45, 45, 10 with the university, the county, and the, and the city. So if we had two hundred fifty thousand dollars, we need to come up with our portion would be forty five percent of that. Is that correct? I got a question. Would uh, the county and university be obligated to pay the remaining percentage of that, or is that just something we hope would, they would do? <coughs> well, there is an agreement uh, that a portion's cost in that fashion. Now, whether or not they are obligated for this specific <laughs> project i don't know without reviewing some stuff but uh well we've got a few answers here and and before we go out and obligate uh, say additional funds that we don't necessarily have this time that we need to say take take a look at uh, What's the time frame? The, if we're going to accept the, if we if we accept the 1.8 million dollars, the time frame is there. They would like it in. They would like to have an answer back to, tomorrow, the seventh. Give us a lot of time. What was the alternate project? Um, the north ramp it's like a parking area for the aircraft okay does that have to be done is the 1.81 million contingent on that being part of the project uh, well that that can be reduced in size we can we can we can change we can ch we don't we the the main thing that we want to get is the is the taxiway if there's money left over we will go and get the ramp if the and uh, and or some part of the ramp. Okay, so what is the cost for the taxiway? The, one the, point three. One point three million. That's the base. That's the that's the base bid. Uh, and we have the one point eight million. Is, is that one point eight million from FAA? That would include, include the. That, that ramp. would include the. That would. As I see this, the way you've got this, uh, Len, it, that includes not only that includes the the taxiway, that includes the ramp, and that includes also some drainage work. But we're not going to get the drainage work, and uh, so. It also doesn't change the ninety-five-five. How's that? This alter the ninety-five-five position of the FAA. Yes. So we're still dealing, of course, with the 95 five of the 1.3. It's even. still an obligation by, from the city to the airport. Well, or to the, except the grant. Yes. Yeah. I, but it would be, yes. Two and a half. What you want to do with it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, two and a half, assuming that. Uh, the state pays there, two and a half. All right, so. Well, we got national funds for two and a half percent. So we, we, got, we got two and a half percent of it. We would have to pay. The airport would have to pay two and a half percent, and the airport it would probably it would come out of our budget probably. And uh, okay. how long is this project going to take? It will. It will probably take. It probably won't be done until next spring. But it will be. They will start right away. if the board chose to uh, approve the local share of the 1.3 would that be sufficient to get the project that would mean that we're going there would be no ramp then uh, exactly 
that's the alternate, is it not? That would be the that would be the the the, uh, the first alternate. No, it's just the base, the one point three. That's the base. Is a base, and then the alternate is a is a round, and that would be one point seven. That would be one point seven uh, seven something. But it is the taxiway that is the critical thing here, is it not? Correct. Yeah. We have, uh, this is one of the first times that we have gotten a loan like this from the, from the federal government and the state. And it is the largest to date. And uh, the reason we have it is because we, 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 uh, we did an airport layout plan. And, uh, and, they, and, and so, so we, we qualified for it in this one. You know, of course, as I like to support sweep accounts, uh, yes. I don't like turning down a $1.8 million grant for improvements that are needed at our municipal airport. The Even problem is the local share. We can do one of two things. We take the 10 percent that we're going to be getting off the 2 percent that we'll no longer get the 20 percent from. And over <laughs> a period of time to the spring would uh, create, I think, that uh, 10 percent is going to create that much mad a month. Isn't that about $7,000 a month. And it's already applied towards the, your general budget. Right, to economic right. development within the general fund. It could be that it falls within two budget years. Well, that's where I'm coming from, if we could grow into some of this uh, stuff right here. And I'm not still clear how much money we need to come up with at this particular point. What's our 45 percent, $250,000? If, uh, let's see. Well, well, now we're, so it depends on, we've got to start again and talk about whatever number we're working with. If we're talking about. $40,000. If we're talking about the our 2.5 percent share of a $1.8 million dollar project, it's $45,000. About. And we have until the spring to do this? We've got to, we've got to accept, we have to accept the, we have to accept the grant now. But you said the work would be done in the spring. The work would not be done until, until, until at least at least until, but you can never tell. But but it but it probably it won't be. If it's been like in the past, it's taken a good long time to do it. So it probably probably would be next next winter, next spring. Man, that sweep account looks better all the time, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, that it does. If we could just get it set up according to law. Mm -hmm. uh, Alderman Cox, was your two and a half percent of the of the forty five? Was that forty five thousand from? 45% of the 2.5%? <laughs> no, it was, it was a straight, two, uh, as, I, as I thought I understood, it was the FAA was 95%, the right. state is 25 and right. then the city, period, is 25 so. Well, it's the airport is 25 It's the so airport. So you've got 45%. Uh, no. So okay. it's actually. It is, well, it would be the city, since That's you're doing the, the, the grant is coming to the city. But okay. it's, it's the, it's the, the, the 5%, it happens. Half of the five percent is the state. Mm -hmm. They pay. They pick up half of it, and uh, the MDOT picks up half of it. Are and there any electrical lights that got to be added to this thing? Are there? Yes, they will. That really? includes. And that's how much in, is that? That's that's, that's in included. it. That's included. That's that is as is. I see Ed taking a big sigh of relief yeah. back there. <laughs> so. If I understand correctly, then this two and a half percent is the airport share, and our current arrangement with, as part of the airport, the city provides forty-five percent, and the county provides forty-five percent, and the MSU provides ten. So then, our forty-five percent of that two and a half percent of the one point eight million dollar <laughs> grant, we well, roll it, would yes. be twenty thousand four hundred and fifty dollars would be the city's responsibility we if we accept this grant at one point eight. I think we could swing that. Of course. <laughs> Yeah, we could. Yeah. 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 Y
thousand dollars for this two million dollar oh. cost right there. But okay. All right. Which is now, but to be clear, what we're going to approve once we talk about it, we're not talking about accepting a 1.968. No, no. No, we're talking about accepting a 1.8. That's correct. Okay. All right. Well then, I don't know. Well, that's that. all they're going to give us. Right. But but I, if I understood correctly, you were asking us to approve a bid from Ellis Construction at 1.968 million dollars. No, no, no. Okay. So I'll no, we're asking you to accept the, the, the grant. grant. Both the grant. items were on the agenda, gentlemen. For one point eight million. Well, it works. About okay. So we're we're you've already you're, you're asking us to accept the grant of one point eight million. Is that correct? That's correct. And we got the figures worked out twenty thousand dollars. All right, do I have a motion that we accept the grant of one point eight million? So moved. Do we have a second to that? Second. Okay. We have a motion with a second. All those in favor of approving the grant of 1.8 million, please raise your hands. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Let me thank you, but let me apologize for not being better grounded in this because it came to me tonight about 7 o'clock. <laughs> uh, Dr. Russell, we understand now where do we stand with the bid of Ellis Construction Company because that's what's on the agenda that I assume uh, Tom Stennis put on the agenda or somebody did. Uh, was, uh, you accepted that bid. That bid was accepted and sent down back no, in August. No, we have not. We have not accepted anybody's bid in regard to that. Just the airport board has. And the airport board, board has, has, and they've not brought us brought it to us. That's what's in front of you now. Yeah. What was in front of us that we just thought we voted on? I'm sorry. Both items were both items were on the agenda for this evening. One of them, one of them was the was the grant. And the other one was to accept the bid from Ellison Construction. The grant was a short, short notice item because it came in and needed to be voted on tonight in order to be submitted tomorrow. I see. So uh, apparently, we have a bid of $1.9 million and how much dollars? The bid is good for how long? <laughs> 1.968. The bid is good for how long? I don't know the answer to that question. I've got the documentation in the office. It's about yay thick, which is why it wasn't supplied to all. Of course, the, 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 the bid specs would have said uh, the bid. It's about 300 pages. Yes. I understand, but the bid specs would have said that the bid would be good uh, for X number of days, uh, 30, 62 months, something. Uh, so we all will come up with the other $150,000. Well, we may not be able to accept that. Thing. Well, we, we may not be able to accept that. We, just we have the prerogative to go out and rebid that. Is that correct? Uh, or negotiate with That's the low correct. bidder, given the significant differences, and make so some changes. We will, some adjust, we will adjust the round to fit to make the money. Come in with the money. All right. That's what that's what that's correct. Except a little bit of Ellis construction about the instructing the airport forward to reduce the to do more than Yeah, I'm looking at a bid here. But it doesn't have a date on it. I'll let you look at it through this. Uh, I didn't see one in there on that front page. Uh, 60 days after the opening. When were they open? August 9th. August 9th. So we got time. The bid is still good. Still. Uh, though, I think we could go on and accept the low bid of Ellis Construction Company instructing the airport board to negotiate with the construction company reducing the bid in whatever form shape fashion so that it will fit the grant amount of 1.81 million dollars that was the intent okay that was the intent uh, do we have a did you make that informed well then i will move that we accept the low bid of ellis construction company uh, with the stipulation <coughs> that that low bid of one point nine six eight one hundred forty eight dollars and fifteen cents be reduced by the appropriate action of the airport commission to bring the bid in line with 
the available grant funds of $1.81 million. Second. We have a motion with a second. Uh, all those in favor, please raise your hands. Thank you, it passes. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. That brings us down to uh, departmental business. Uh, first of all, Chief Administrative Officer. You have several items here. Uh, right after you get through with yours, and uh, I've got them in car in order. I'll be as possible. I have uh, requested authority to, to proceed with the citizen survey. I discussed it with the various uh, board members over the last uh, few weeks. Um, the citizen survey, um, using the graduate students, Dr. Clinch's department had uh, indicated that they wanted a project for their graduate students, and a citizen survey would allow us to. Um, get a baseline of where we excel and where we may be lacking in some of our city services, get a sort of customer response. They have the um, opportunity to develop some questions that will give us um, some information about sanitation, about parks and rec, about all the things that the city does, the services we provide. And I thought that this might be a good opportunity to um, show the citizens that we're interested in what they think. And give us an opportunity to respond <coughs> to the issues that they may raise and also allow us to know exactly what we're doing well and what we can improve on. So it's um, something I thought might be a good project for them and a good project for us, give us good information in a, in a way. It shouldn't cost us any funds except perhaps copying costs. Um, they have the phone bank that they'll use. They're going to develop the survey. And there were some students who were here earlier, but I think they gave up on us and, and left. So, um, I just wanted the board to consider this and, and perhaps approve it if, if at all possible. And the reason I, the agenda was long, but I brought it anyway was just because in order to get it rolling, they needed a little time to develop questions, et cetera, et cetera, and go through the hoops that the university required to do it. So. I would move then that the city authorize using the uh, graduate students from the public policy division of the political science department to uh, do a citizen survey of uh, of attitudes and all sorts of things with the stipulation that the questionnaire be given to the board for review prior to it being implemented. We have a motion second? Second. We have a motion with a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the second issue was a, to request approval to seek historical status for City Hall, and Michelle is here, Michelle Jones is here, she's the historical expert. Um, my thought being that uh, it might be a give, a, give us an opportunity to get some funds to renovate City Hall, and she can speak to that uh, for you. I'm actually an employee of the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, Historic Preservation Division. Um, I run a Northfield office, so I get to be here in Starkville. But um, we administer the antiquities okay, law, which was passed in 1970 and amended in 1983, which administers the Mississippi Landmark Program, which specifically deals with publicly owned properties that are deemed to be historic. And um, Ms. Brill asked that I be here to answer any questions you might have about landmark status for City Hall. Ms. Jones, just couple of questions. If we pursue historical status, can you tell what restrictions we'll have on this building? This building was built as a city hall and as National Guard Armory. The, um, the guard unit that was here was called up before the building was actually um, finished. So it really talks about the history of World War II in our county and how that relates into a larger statewide context. That being said, what is historically important about this building is actually the outside shell. Obviously, this whole part of the building was once open auditorium space and doesn't have any historic integrity. Um, Mississippi landmark status does not mean that you have to get permission for routine maintenance. If um, the building department wants to paint its walls, you know, that doesn't require any special permission. Um, it's only for major restoration projects. So is there any proposed work that could affect the historical or architectural character of something designated a landmark is subject to review by the uh, permit committee of uh, archives and history? Um, 
there are the legislature has been very kind to the Department of Archives and History in the past five years, and there are numerous grants available to municipalities now for historic landmarks, and Mississippi landmark status is just one guarantee that a municipality or county is going to be a good steward of that historic property once it's restored. So it's just a way of making sure that the public good is served once public funds are expended. Would, if we at a later date decide that um, the best use for this building um, would be to move it or demolish it for other purposes, if we had landmark status, would we be able to do that? You would have to um, apply to the permit committee for that. And so it would no longer be our decision to make. Um, to, in, in, in other words, if we did this, we would be turning over that authority to another agency. Um, precisely, yes but in a broader scope, this is a publicly owned building. So if a public contingency within the community decided that they were not, that they were opposed to the demolition mm -hmm. of the building, um, the department could impose landmark status on the building. It's, it is public policy. I mean, that's what the legislature decided, that it was good public policy and that these historic buildings had a place in our um, collective community. And so, while the city and <coughs> counties can apply for this status, it also can be imposed in cases of demolition. I guess so. Obviously, the department would rather be good partners with municipalities and counties. Right. I guess and I appreciate the, the architecture of the building. It, it, if I understand correctly, it's Art Modern, um, which is some school of art deco. Um, and uh, I certainly appreciate that. I just am concerned at this point if we put any restrictions on ourselves as we still haven't made a final decision on uh, the Justice Complex or even the City Comprehensive Plan and, and long-term plans for a City Hall. Um, I'd hate for us to put any restrictions on ourselves prior to that, even though I personally see significant value in this building. And, and uh, I know while it's been discussed that maybe it would be best used as a parking lot, uh, I don't think that's appropriate uh, given its historical status. Yet at the same time, I don't think I'd be, uh, I'd be doing the right thing if I put any additional restrictions on us while we haven't made some decisions about what to use it for. Mr. Mayor, yes, sir. Oh, you have any comments on this? Are the comments? I did have somewhat no, of a follow-up question. He wants to hear the mayor's. Oh, uh, go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, do you have any comments? Well, I do. That uh, if you look through this building, it has a great interior space. Good. Uh, there's only one other uh, city hall in the state of Mississippi. I understand that uh, is kind of an art deco, and I believe that is in Bay St. Louis. Is that not correct? It was, was, in was in St. Louis. I can't even believe that the hurricane I mean, blew away at 12 And I guess that, that is the thing is, is when we look at what's just happened, you know, the buildings, uh, the vast devastation is awful, but then we all have those shared memories of those historic places, and I think that is what is important, you know, with, within our collective memories. Um, that's one reason it's in the public good to preserve these buildings. Uh, this particular building could look uh, very good uh, if it were redone according <coughs> to historical uh, uh, guidelines. Uh, it has great space inside of this facility. If you've not looked at it, we've got an auditorium on this back side. Or we've got a great space back here in this back. It's got 24-foot ceilings and issues. Uh, 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 it could be gutted. It was not a particular outstanding job, uh, Mr. McLaurin, when it was done, but I guess it was done with budget at the time. Is that correct? And that I, is correct. And the then city mayor personally got his hammer. There. That's that's dangerous. <laughs> that's just dangerous. But we have a we have a great facility potential here. Once you get the police department out, and uh, uh, you could rearrange this thing. Uh, uh, it can look great. Some good examples of how good it can look. Uh, I'd invite all of you to the building department in the next uh, 30 days in which uh, the orange carpet will be taken up up there and it will be exposing the hardwood floors and the ambiance that uh, we will have up there will really be totally different from what we, we're used to. Uh, this is a great building to say certainly reuse. 
saves money to reuse your historical buildings, let me assure you. Will they restrict the size and use of this building? Um, use is not something that the Department of Archives What about the size? This building is much larger than the National Guard Army was. And what I'm saying is if we get uh, to use this building, uh, can it be larger than the original National Guard Army? Um, the department advocates adaptive reuse, which means that possibly things aren't used as they originally were, but they fulfill a, a present and current need of a community. So that would be a permit issue, but, and I'm not on that permit committee, but I would say it would be taken under consideration um, if you wanted to change the main entrance to the building so that you met ADA requirements more. I mean, changes could be made. It doesn't have to be original function and use. The front doors don't always have to be the front doors. Does, does that answer your question? Okay, but you don't have to have the appearance of a coincidence. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm not on the permit committee, so I, I could not answer that question. With well, that's just some things that I remember about this, and very few people remember what this was 40 years ago, telling my age. But, uh, you know, we need to know these things before we proceed. Uh, what is expected to use this building, if it goes back to the original size of this concert hut or the National Guard arm, uh, it might not be feasible at all for a city hall. Well, and the law does not require that you regress a building to a certain point. So there, there is no law that says once a landmark is declared that you have to regress. Uh, and I don't know. Okay. Any other discussion? Yeah, I had a question. Yes. Uh, if it's designated as a Mississippi landmark, it, it enables us well, to apply for certain grant monies. If we don't actually draw down that grant money, do we fall under the purview of this permit committee? So we once do. we do it, I mean, and, you know, obviously the question is you're you're not going to apply for the next cycle, which that deadline sure. was actually extended <coughs> to October 7th, given the storm. But this is information to have and to keep. I think it's, I mean, I'm very fond of this building, but it's not something that has to be done today. It's not going to make you ineligible for grants. Archives is not going to come up here and say, we would have given you a million dollars if only you had been a Mississippi landmark. Um, but if at the point that the board has developed a plan and a use for this building, um, this would be the first step in allowing the city to apply for those grant funds. Right. Okay. Thank you, Michelle. Do we have any motions? I would move we take the matter under advisement for <coughs> continued review and uh, please keep us posted with information and things occur until such time as we get a better feel for uh, existing projects and needs of the city. And I so move. Second. We have a second. So it's certainly nice to have your expertise here in Starkville. And, and, and I hope our questions don't reflect anything other than us being very careful um, while we're in all this extensive comprehensive planning process. And it sounds like a great opportunity once we make those decisions um, to pursue some, some grant money and protect this building for, for our kids. Did we have a second to that motion? Yeah, did you did. second that? I did. The DC's motion? I did. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, brings us up discussion and approval of the AWOS contract. The AWOS contract, uh, yes. <coughs> and I, took, uh, I took liberties with Rodney's uh, previous language and other contracts and um, amended, amended the contract to reflect uh, 60, uh, 30 day notice as opposed to 60 day notice for, uh, for a renewal. As it stands now, it says it would renew in a year if you didn't for a year if you didn't notice them 60 days prior. Also recommend that we add a contractual language that uh, makes the contract terminable by either party with a 90 day notice of cancellation. <coughs> and then under the miscellaneous section, um, state that the contract is subject to the laws of Mississippi rather than the state of Tennessee. And then again, uh, a whole harmless clause that includes the city as well as the uh, contractor. 
and I received Rodney's approval on <laughs> his verbal approval on those particular items. But if the AWAS contract is, is your report is done, it's the, um, the weather the weather observation station, and uh, it's the maintenance agreement for that for that contract. End of discussion. Will this be any additional, I guess, how does this impact the budget, if at all, um, but, entering into this contract? It's, uh, it's part of the airport, um, it's part of the airport budget. Thank you. It's part of the airport budget, and it's in the airport budget. Sorry, I didn't know. Okay. Yeah, sure. End of discussion. Do we have a motion? I would move approval of the AWAS contract as amended. Do we have a second? Second. Do we have a second? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That brings us down to discussion, adoption of fuel con uh, conservation for the city. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this matter came up, uh, all the clocks were brought it to our attention when all the fuel lines were gathering at the pumps. And uh, then as we began to, uh, Doug began to get into um, how much fuel we actually had at the fuel farm, um, we determined that uh, there may be some possibility that we might run a little short ourselves. And that being said, uh, fuel conservation policy seemed an appropriate measure to take um, in two ways. One, just a natural fuel pol a, a natural conservation policy for the city, and then again, a conservation policy that dictates some uh, more drastic or just <coughs> strict measures of operation for a short period of time to make sure that we don't run out. Um, specifically, Doug's uh, inventory for the day is we have 1907 <coughs> gallons of unleaded. Weekly consumption is 2,157, and divide that up, we've got about 6.1 days supply at this point in time. Diesel inventory for today is 5,298 gallons. Uh, weekly consumption is 1,238 gallons, and weeks supplies approximately 4.3 weeks supply um, and availability is on a day-to-day -day basis and apparently no advance orders are being accepted at this time so our next call is going to be on Thursday for a Friday delivery with as I understand right now no guarantee of what we're going to get which is why the depending on how we want to take the approach whether we go into a strict mode and, and because we're operating right now under the emergency status that was authorized by the board and continued again this evening uh, the police, you have letters in front of you, and what all the department heads have, how they've responded with each department as to what they're going to do to conserve fuel for this brief, hopefully brief period of time for the next week. I asked them to do something for you a month or three months on time plan, and that's how they responded. Uh, obviously, there are things that we want to be doing, particularly Chief Grant wants his guys to go out and work out. There's some things that are obviously morale boosters that are, but are not necessarily um, that would allow us to conserve fuel. And that would be one of the things I wanted the board to consider. Um, the more controversial is going to be Ms. Boyd's um, sanitation department. And I know that the discussion of one day a week versus two days a week is always uh, difficult. I asked her to prepare for uh, the concept of one day a week, and she worked diligently and did so. Uh, and I did that knowing the board probably would not be real happy, uh, or no one in town would be real happy with the end result of that, but I felt as though in uh, using prudence and, and you know, in our best interest to at least consider it, whether we adopt it or not. So she came up with a schedule that would work on one day a week. Um, and I don't know at this point in time whether or not you know, the board really wants to, to go that strict, but it would be a, certainly a stricter measure. Um, and I'm not going to make any necessarily any recommendation because we don't have figures of exactly how much that would save, but I think it's you know, obviously you save a certain amount. But um, until we get in the slightly more crisis mode, maybe we, want, we don't want to go there. But I wanted the board to at least consider what the possibilities were and see how, how strict the mode we wanted to stay in for what period of time based on the information that we had in front of us. Um, any suggestions for the board members? Any comments? Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Ms. Pruitt, we always appreciate your leadership on these uh, governmental matters, and uh, particularly uh, we appreciate your uh, interest in wanting to ensure that we conserve fuel as we uh, operate in this very tight uh, economic crisis. However, at the same time, I am not in favor of reducing uh, city services, particularly uh, I am strongly opposed to 
reducing residential garbage collection from two days a week to one day a week. We've discussed that over the past several years about going to one day per week. So I am in favor of keeping uh, two day a week for residential garbage collection. Additionally, I am in favor of keeping the five days of, uh, of mowing the right of ways as opposed to going to three. Uh, the staff can't even cut the grass in five days. Well, let's go into three days. So we need to uh, keep that at that level. So. Um, you know, if there's any other basic service, um, I'm not in favor of reducing it, but those are the two of the main things that really stand out mm -hmm. at me. So I want to go on record to uh, let the, the mayor and the, the board know in a very respectful way that I'm not in favor of reducing those two particular uh, concerns. Any other board members with comments pertaining to this? Yes, uh, I would uh, like to bring to the attention of the board, I think the board, uh, members have received a letter uh, that it wasn't signed but it was uh, sent to uh, the board, a uh, uh, previous board and it's been sent again. Um, it, a lot of people and citizens are concerned about our city policemen uh, driving from 7 to 20 miles a day. Uh, home and their police cars living outside the city limit. And have we ceased to do this now or are we still allowing this to be uh, happening? No, sir, we did not cease that, that particular operation. I think you have in front of you, um, Sister Chief Outlaw's response to the department head, um, guys them to go into the stricter mode of fuel conservation. Um, he outlined what the department was going to do the chief that or if you want to change uh, that. So, <coughs> you are so stating that we are continuing to do this. Yes, sir. We have, that is not what was, uh, what was changed. The um, gasoline conservation of the police department was lifted to reduce the mileage by 25% uh, where possible, turn off the vehicles while out of the car unless some blue lights are needed, come in and walk and talk more than riding, utilize bike patrol, uh, mm -hmm. run stationary radar instead of roaming it's radar. Well, I'd like to interject at uh, this time that we uh, may not be a proper time, but I noticed that we had a great increase in uh, fuel usage of the police cars, and I understand this is a policy that has been started back. Uh, that was stopped in the last administration. Um, I don't know, uh, uh, I think I asked Chief Lindsay during the interview, uh, why are we doing this to start with? And he so stated that it was in the event that we have a call back. And uh, in my opinion, and I'd like to know the rest of the board's opinion, uh, any employee that's called back on duty for any reason, any city employee that uh, living outside the city limits of Starkville should uh, produce their own transportation back and forth to work. I'd just like to hear if anybody else got a comment about it because it can get quite expensive. Thank Mr. Davis. Uh, Go ahead, uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, First of all, uh, I'd, I'd like to concur with Alderman Perkins' comments about uh, the sanitation department uh, and two-day of week pickup. I, if, if I heard you correctly, we've got, if we were not to get any diesel, we've got four weeks of diesel? Three weeks. Three of weeks, diesel. weeks of diesel? Yes, we do. And, and that's to go, but we expect to get a shipment. And, yes, and primarily... We are, no, no promises have been made. Right. It's more a matter of... But primarily, uh, our sanitation department runs on diesel from looking on this, so uh, we should be pretty good on that. So I would like to concur with Alderman Perkins as far as uh, continuing our regular schedule of pickup. Um, as far as the take-home fleet, uh, it also has a fiscal impact on the department's budget and planning for equipment and replacement of cars. If I remember correctly, one of the, one of the things about the take-home fleet is that it actually extends the life of a police cruiser and off the top of my head, if, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Chief, but is it not from a three-year lifespan to about a nine-year lifespan Correct. on those vehicles? Absolutely. So um, it, 
it, it's not just as simple as looking at the, 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 the fuel usage because you are getting six more years out of a police cruiser's life and functional, functional use within the city's fleet. Uh, it's, you know, it, it is a balancing act, of course, but I think that the positives far outweigh the negatives of that situation. Just, just to follow up on that, the life of the car, and I don't want to get too far off, off subject, can you explain why that would be? I mean, it seems the most intuitive answer is that you're driving the car less. If it's actually part of a fleet, then it's going to be used in both uh, the AM and the PM shift. If you're doing a take-home car, of course, you're adding cars, driving them out into the county. Um, but it's only being used for one shift. So I'm wondering if that isn't part of the reason why the place, that the life of the cars are longer. Um, it seems like you might be using the same amount of mileage. Actually, that's incorrect. Uh, as I provided to all the board members, uh, we have a very specific assigned vehicle policy take-home program. Uh, some of the advantages to it that we have listed are to, to promote the security of the citizens of the city of start with a greater visibility and presence of police vehicles on the street and highways to deter crime by limiting the opportunity for criminals to commit an act through the presence of more patrol vehicles to provide quicker response time to an emergency requiring off-duty personnel to reduce maintenance costs on vehicles in the fleet by establishing the vehicle's usable life to reduce the yearly mileage on each vehicle, thereby increasing the vehicle's usable life, to maintain vehicles in top operating condition through preventative maintenance and personal assignments, and to provide increased incentive and morale of all personnel. Now, I might, in addition to add that uh, uh, average Crown Victoria patrol car costs $20,000. If you spread that $20,000 out over a nine-year uh, policy or uh, frame of time, you will see that the actual investment per car is very minimal. Uh, it's very cost effective to do this. I would also remind the board that the city of Starkville currently has 22,500 population. The city of Columbus has 25,000 population. I have 47 police officers. Columbus has 77. The only reason that I can hold the line on public safety in the city of Starkville is with this take-home fleet. We have been letting cars go into the county for particular officers as long as I've been employed here since 1975. Uh, this mostly used to be with command officers that live in the county or detectives or narcotics officers. We started the take-home fleet concept because it is utilized by every other law enforcement agency and has been found to be very cost-effective. Mr. Mills, you will recall when you were a deputy sheriff, you had a take-home patrol car, I, I believe. I lived in the city limits of Star. Yes, sir. But I believe you had a take-home car. Yes, I did. I thought so. Uh, I also recall that the all the sheriff's departments, highway patrol, ATF, Bureau of Narcotics, Every law enforcement agency that you can think of has take-home cars. It is a very practical matter. It assures accountability on a car. If a car is damaged, you know who to go to for the car. Maintenance is the responsibility for the officer. It gets much more increased mileage and better use out of the car. And our whole disaster plan is built around a take-home fleet. Obviously, from what we've just seen with Hurricane Katrina, the first two or three days of any crisis, you're basically on your own. What we're seeing right now is a national scandal in media is a lack of response from FEMA, NEMA, and outside agencies to come in and save citizens' lives. It falls back on the local person. A police officer without a police car is no more effective than a cavalry one without a horse. That's where all his equipment is. That's where all his emergency gear is. That's where all the things are that make him a productive uh, element in providing public safety. So therefore, it is extremely important that if we're going to continue to provide for this community at 47 officers, what Columbus is doing with 77, that this fleet not be affected. I might also add this. 
in regard to fuel consumption by the Starkville Police Department. Uh, we actually should be coming in at less fuel consumption due to the fact that we project for 47 cars for 47 officers to be running 12 months out of the year. Currently, I have three officers that are deployed uh, to Iraq in military deployment. I just had another two that were activated to go to the Gulf Coast. So that's five cars that won't be rolling. In addition to that, we hired two patrol officers tonight that will start as rookies. And it'll be some several months before they're capable of getting in the cars and actually riding alone by themselves. So that's seven cars right there that we'll be saving fuel consumption on. So my fuel consumption actually should go down dramatically. And I think that most of what we're seeing right now is a spike in the uh, fuel rate. And I think that this will come down over a period of time. And uh, I believe we can suffer through. This is not something that is unique to the Starkville Police Department. It's affecting every city and every county and every community and every state across the United States. And uh, the take-home fleet allows us to protect this community. And I'm a big um, supporter of it, as is all the other law enforcement agencies that I've named. It works. The reason that it works is because it's effective, and that's what makes us be able to do what we do. Chief, I appreciate that, and I, I guess I've got a problem because I'm an economist and I, I look for facts. So the, the question that I asked um, that I'm not certain I got an answer to okay. is, is I'm just trying to understand why we believe and have experienced a going from, we believe a, ta a regular fleet car gets three years, yes. a take-home fleet gets nine years, and I didn't right. hear anything specific. What I was conjecturing is that if perhaps when you have a, a, a vehicle right outside the police department that get used for a.m. and p.m. that's going to have say a hundred thousand miles during that year if you have a car that's only used in the a.m. that then gets taken home to the county at night then that perhaps has fifty thousand miles and so what I'm trying to establish is why do we think that you're getting more use out of the car um, by this policy and it sounds like there's some very good reasons I just didn't hear any of them in your speech I absolutely know we are. Okay. Number one, uh, I have had a take-home car since 1979 myself, and I can tell you, uh, and we can prove it statistically if we need to through the shop, that a car assigned to one individual will last much longer than a car that is assigned to several individuals that have less of an incentive to take care of it, is subject to um, harder driving and it never stops. It runs 24-7, 365. Mm -hmm. That's what you get into with a fleet concept. A fleet concept, a car never quits rolling. With an assigned unit, the car does not function but six months out of the year because the way our shifts work with 12-hour shifts, basically out of a two-week period, you work seven days and you're off seven days. So that car rests six months out of a year. Now, in addition to that car resting and not being run for 24-7, 365 is in a fleet concept, which is where your cars tear up. Uh, not only is it resting for six months, but you're getting actually less mileage out of it and more accountability on the individual car because you know who's driving that car. Would you say from a total mileage standpoint that a car that you're replacing every nine years today has the same number of miles on the car that a that if you want a, a fleet concept, it would be with three years. I, I guess I'm having a hard time figuring out how we're actually thinking that we're saving money if we're actually doing, if in fact it would be the same number of miles. And I'm not, ex I didn't come to pick a fight. I would have come much better prepared if I had. I'm just trying to determine how we actually think. I would have better to defend myself <laughs> if I had known I was going to be attacked. So the question is, and, and I don't, I mean, and do you understand my question? It sounds like it may be the exact same number of miles. At the end of nine years, as it is in three. three. And I'm guessing that that's probably the case. <coughs> okay. Uh, do, you have this, do you have those numbers actually, Chief? You know, that at the end of nine years, when the, when the car dies. So well, really I know right like now we've got cars in service that are 10 years old. Yeah. And uh, we've got this thing set up on. We buy 15 cars every three years, and we buy them on a lease purchase. So if you bought five cars a year for $100,000 are and replaced them every couple of years because they're worn out from running all the time. Mm -hmm. Or if you buy 15 cars and you pay for them over 
three years, your actual amount of money that you're paying is the same. And because your cars will last nine years assigned to one officer, then we've got it set up on a nine year rotation of replacement. So you get 45 cars in a nine year period. Now obviously if you've got 47 officers, you're gonna to need to pick up a couple of extra cars. For instance, this year we picked up a vehicle through FEMA, which is uh, not FEMA, through Homeland Defense, which is no uh, expense to the city. We also have money in the DARE account to pick up another vehicle uh, for that uh, that would be of no uh, cost out of general fund. So this system works, and it was well researched by all of my predecessors, and as I said, it works for every other law enforcement agency, Highway Patrol, Sheriff's Department, you name it, they all do it. It's just that most cities have not been fortunate enough to be long range in their planning to work into a take-home fleet like we have. And we've been working on this for almost 10 years, and we've only had it completed within the last two. And it's very successful, and it's working great for us right now. It's not just a mileage factor either. It's, no. it's the wear and tear and the taking care of. Well, and on top of that, let's go back to what we just saw in New Orleans, okay? Our emergency scenario is with 47 officers. You're going to lose some cars, and you're going to lose some officers if a tornado hits a city and takes out half of it, or an ice storm, or whatever. This could, we can see that a natural disaster could happen, or any one of a number of other situations. The emergency situation is, and FEMA will tell you this, for the first two or three days, you're on your own. You're gonna have very limited resources other than what you can put together yourself to save your citizens. If the worst scenario hits and we lose half this town in a uh, tornado, our plan is to put people on 12 hour shifts and you would bring in four platoons Put two, of 10 each, you would put two on nights and two on days. And you would run like that until you could break it down and go back to one 10 man platoon per 12 hour shift. Now this is putting everybody in uniform, detectives, narcotics, and it would still leave you a cushion for casualties out of that 47 and you're gonna have some. Uh, where they won't be able to come, or uh, logistical support, because somebody will still need to be there to order fuel and whatever else we need. But that's our basic concept. Right now, if a tornado hits this city, I can put the people on the street, in the cars, or any other natural disaster that I can just about take care of us. And we're there. Uh, we're there uh, with the expenses and the money that we've invested over the last 10 years to get us there. We've done a real good job. She says started this, basically. But it all goes back to narcotics, command officers, detectives, other people on call have all had take-home cars. So it was just a very few cars or officers in the force that didn't have these cars anyway. And if you look at your state troopers or your deputies, we're doing the same thing that they do. And it's working for them and it's working for us. So I know that the city's in a crunch right now for money, but I'm absolutely asking y'all, not, do not try and uh, do something that would be penny wise and dollar foolish, because this is what saving this community in public safety. I can tell you with the Starkville Police Department, the city of Stark. Steve, let me ask you one other question. Yes, if we, if we actually had an emergency where you would call, uh, an officer back on duty. And we said we're gonna call one in Morgantown. Okay. Is he gonna get in that automobile and is he gonna turn his blue lights on? Is he gonna run his siren at 80 and 85 from Morgantown to Stark? It would depend on the emergency, Mr. Mills. And I'm not trying to pick on you, Chief. I've been knowing you and I've been calling you David for years. And I'm not trying to pick on you, yes, sir. but we've got a situation that we're getting a lot of complaints about, and we need to. What are the complaints, Mr. Mills? Well, you see, it is letters circulating everywhere. Well, I have getting, reason to believe that this letter is an anonymous. Letter. Well, it could be. It is an anonymous. I have letter. a letter. That I think that I discussed with you that you accused me of writing. No, sir. I never accused you well, of writing that letter. That's not what the sheriff said. But I'm, I never I'm accused saying, you of that. If the I'm sheriff saying, told you that, he's a friend of mine. I'd be glad to discuss it with you. But I will say this, gentlemen, calm yourselves. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm very calm. 
I but, have uh, never in my career, nor will I ever, respond to anonymous complaints. And here's why. If somebody wrote me a letter and said, Jim Mills is a child molester, I would not go to your next door neighbors and ask them if that was true. That is an unfair thing to do. If somebody has a legitimate complaint to make against my officers, we have a very specific, structured, investigative method to take that complaint, record it, who it came from, and ask that individual to come put it in writing and go on the record and we'll investigate it. This is a very thorough and adequate policy that covers everything that my police officers do when they take home vehicle. If anyone has any knowledge that any of my officers are in violation of this, all they have to do is make this complaint and report it, and we will investigate it. And if it is true, and I find that they are in violation, there are parts of this uh, very policy that I can take this car away from them. This is a discretionary assignment policy. It is not mandatory. But if you do agree to take a car home, you have to be able to be willing to respond when called on. If we call an officer and they're not available for call, we'll take this car back away from them. Gentlemen, I know about this anonymous letter. It was sent to the last board mayor. It was ignored. It's been sent now to you all. And I understand that y'all are new <coughs> government officials trying to do a good job for the public. But I can assure you that I have never, nor will I ever, respond to anonymous complaints. If somebody has a legitimate complaint, there should be enough of a lady or a gentleman to step forward, put their name on the record, and we'll investigate it. But I'm not going to subject myself and my officers in my department to someone that has no more Backbone. Thank you. than to come forward with their complaint. And I have very strong reason to believe that this letter was fostered, generated, and written by somebody that has an ax to grind with the police department. Yeah, they have a lot of Bills, knowledge of, of what was going on. Yes, sir, they sure do. And I can just about tell you I know who wrote it. And I can Mr. just Mayor. about tell you who all. Uh, can we run this? Ms. This doesn't have anything to do with uh, fuel consumption. It does. So, well, that the gets people. to be a matter of opinion in regard to the overall gesture of this. And I don't feel like that we're getting anywhere with the discussion, discussion and adoption of a fuel conservation for the city of Starfall. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Yes, ma'am. But since we've opened this up, I do have a question so that I will be intelligent about this. So if yes, I'm asked, I will have an intelligent answer. Yes, ma'am. My first question is, how many uh, take-home uh, cars do you have? How many officers take? We have 47 police officers and we mm -hmm. have 47 take-home cars. 47 we have 49 total cars in the fleet. We have one extra patrol car, marked car, and we have one extra plane car. Okay. Did I understand you to say that uh, each officer that, that take home a vehicle, so that's all of them, yes, what you're saying, that they are responsible for the maintenance of that vehicle? Did no, ma'am. They're, in, they're responsible for making sure that vehicle gets proper maintenance, proper maintenance. through the city okay. barn. Well, see, that, said that I want to be intelligent uh, about this now. Right. That way you don't have to have that car um, lacking on when it's supposed to have the tires rotated or the oil changed or something like that. In other words, they have to take the car in. They don't bring it in and leave it. Somebody else has to haul it to the barn and things like that. The vehicle maintenance for that car is their assigned responsibility to get it in. And that's what helps uh, make the car last longer. Thank you, Don, uh, Mr. Ledley. Yes, sir. Thank all you right. very much. Thank you all. So back to fuel conservation. Um, by the way, I have a 1991 Crown Victoria that you can add to your police fleet out there if you'd like to. Mayor, you might need to pay that, uh, sell that to pay that. Money. Yeah, that's right. How much right. longer we going to hear about that car? <laughs> I'm going to tell you every day I see it. Uh, so do we not uh, decide to do anything with full fuel consumption? We just got a report, basically, in regard to that. Well, what I, what I was asking you, I, I've gotten the feedback, let me make sure I've gotten the proper feedback and that the board is in a consensus. We want to keep them at five days a week. Is yep. that, well, I have that, that you got that, and okay. you got where the, they don't want any chart change and two day a week trash they pickup. Trash pickup, and the board, is, the board is good with that. The other, the other thing I would ask them to do with those particular items is the fuel conservation policy was very generic or very general. It didn't speak to the specifics. The other was the strict 
time frame that we were dealing with, like the next week or month or two months or three months. Perhaps when we run out of fuel, you can bring all this back. Well, I mean, I'd hope we do it before then. But this was just a, just a general, will the, you know, does the board want to adopt a fuel conservation policy as such? That's not to address the two two day two week two day a week pickup or the three cuttings versus the five cuttings. This is the, we will change our air filters, we will combine errands where we can, we will do general versus specific. And if the board doesn't want to do that, that's fine. I just wanted to put it in front of you and say we have to kind of Well, we'll have another meeting in approximately uh, five, no, five days with the budget meeting. Right. And so these were, be, we could get maybe an update. That's fine. Do you have a hurricane impact update? I'm not sure anyone wants to hear it. I'm not sure I want to. Make it three minutes. Uh, well, okay. Um, I was going to provide these. And may I make a statement to the rest of you to come up here, the speak response. with uh, uh, quickness, because uh, we get this meeting over with, okay? These, these are the folks who are part of the, the response team, and just for your information. Thank you. Um, the mayor and I attended a meeting this afternoon, which we'll have another meeting on the 13th is the next one, and I was going to provide you with information regarding who was who was there and what they were doing and what the needs were and I'll just leave <coughs> all the needs in case someone might have some but some of the needs that were discussed were in building in order to um, uh, process some people for um, for FEMA aid and that sort of thing they need pillows blankets balls of water gift uh, gift cards and I presume that to like a Walmart gift card or a Lowe's gift card or something like this soft drinks juice baby items clean supplies and computer banks uh, with people to man them, and that's again put in for FEMA uh, assistance. The Red Cross is now a service center for feeding folks, and they feed them at 7.30, 12 o'clock, and 5.30, and they need volunteers. There's no one actually staying there. Most folks who are staying are staying at the First Baptist Church. Um, they're providing housing matchups, employing matchups, so if anybody uh, has any employment that they know of or any, any housing that they know of, and there's also volunteers signed up, and that's at the, the First United United church um, and I'll let it go with that but that's just in case anybody audience or board members have some folks that need some help. Mr. Robble. Yes. Uh, we need uh, you in regard to the final draft of PNZ. Uh, Mr. Mill. I believe that was taken off the consent agenda. May I quickly say why Mr. Romo is coming up? Uh, that was a concern of mine earlier. Uh, the initial draft that was in the board packet was not the latest revision. It did not have the last language that was included in Section 5, so I would take it that, that is, that's the Ms. Ms. Brewer, that that's now before us. And, and, just, and, and just to just say real quickly for the board to know why they're looking for it, that last draft in this specific language that uh, if any member uh, that was appointed to represent a, a ward and that member uh, moves away from that particular ward, then he or she automatically vacates uh, his membership of the commission. And that's been the interpretation of the board with just specific language to make it And I think clear. that's been corrected. Yes, sir. And I, I just think you made that motion. Mr. That's Mr. all been corrected. Mr. Mayor, board. Looking at over, uh, this is a very generous size planning commission. I don't particularly have any problem with it because I have a very enthusiastic group and we have about seven or eight my, my major items which I think that this commission can address and bring to your attention. My only concern is that sometimes getting a quorum of eight members might be a difficulty. But as far as the structure and, and the operation and so forth, uh, I have no problem with that. Uh, thank you. Any other questions, Mr. Robble? Not. Thank you, but, sir. <laughs> that brings us down to the Public Works Department. We're going to adopt this. Order. Uh, excuse me. Yes, we need to approve that uh, corrected uh, uh, one. Would you make the motion, please, Mr. Smith? Yes. Someone. Ms. May I move approval of this uh, adoption of this final ordinance that we just alluded to for the planning zone commission? Uh, that's the one with the correction of uh, if you move out of the area. Yes, I think sir. Mr. McLaurin made that motion previously in the other board meeting. Do we have a second of that? Second. We have a motion to approve. Uh, P and Z information tonight. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Do you have a question? Oh, I got some comments to make. Okay, go ahead. 
Just slow down. All right. I know everybody wants to go home. Just slow down a little bit, please. Go ahead and make your comments. I will. Um, a couple of things. Section 2 talks about composition of this board, uh, and it discusses what we have done previously, going to the 12 members with the board reverting back to nine members when appointments go back. But then in terms of office, we go in and we're talking about uh, the original formation, and we've got appointed to two years, four years, six years, then being eligible to reapply for reappointment and everything else. If we're going to, you know, uh, it, it seems to me that at this juncture, those two sections are in conflict with each other. Another comment I have about this is that, once again, we are talking about uh, language in here for uh, the Board of Appeals and Adjustments, which, or Adjustments and Appeals, excuse me, which we have discussed previously about doing away with altogether. Uh, and I think that it may be. Uh, Okay, so amend it, amend it now, and then come back and amend it at some future point. After uh, Mr. Roman had a chance to look at it and go through it, just because y'all have already actually acted on it, right? And put it in front sure. Of it so that it would, it would represent what you requested to be done a few weeks ago. Right. And look at it again before Mr. Roman had an opportunity to look at the board, the board of trustees. That's acceptable. I'm done. Well, I think we have a motion with a second. Correct. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand, please. We got four. We got four. All those opposed? Two, three, three. four to three. Uh, it passes. That brings us down to uh, public work. Mr. Mayor, that was uh, the city clerk's uh, position. Uh, I've got that on here. I haven't forgotten. Okay. I'll yes, put sir. them in a uh, different order here. Yes, okay? sir. Yes, sir. Okay, we have, we're down to public works. Doug, that's you. If you're oh, awake okay. back there. <laughs> I like the approach. I'm going to stand here. All right. Well, Make it quick. But uh, y'all have this um, uh, policy in your packet, so in the interest of saving time, uh, couple questions. Um, under the adjustments for leaks, which is section 2.300, specifically section 2.331, it, it says for indoor leaks, the amount of consumption for two consecutive high bills in excess of the six month whatever that statement said, but what was y'all's thought of, why wouldn't you just simply use a six month average? Why were you wanting to use the two consecutive high bills in excess? Why would we want to use two consecutive high bills? Right. Because sometimes people don't know they have a leak until they get the bill, uh -huh. and then by the time they fix it, then they need two or three weeks and their hands are going to Okay, so it was the attempt not just to have it be one month, but to be two months, okay. There's some people, and then um, just as a question under the 3.000 enactment it says board approved high consumption bills held in suspension of the state of enactment awaiting the development and adoption of this policy shall be settled in accordance to this policy. So my specific question would be, how does this impact the Whiteheads who came, Reverend Whitehead who came? Um, do you know how this would specifically address his high water bill? Well, according to every in the city, city, and we surveyed it, surveyed it in, and I think I showed you all the results, they're responsible for the bill because they said they didn't have police. Both water and sewer.
Any other questions for Mr. Devlin in regard to the uh, approval of water bill adjustment policy? Did you want to table that for further discussion, or what's your what's your perk? What's your pleasure, board? I'd prefer that you like to take, take it under advisement. Make okay. Yeah, uh, do you have a you make it in the form of a motion? Yes. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second to take the uh, adjustment of the water bill <coughs> policy under advisement. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Approval of the pest management procedure. Can it for some saving time? Go ahead. Mr. Devlin. Yes. Uh, well, first, I just want to end up on this water policy thing. I really appreciate the work that y'all put into it. it. It's obviously very thoughtful, and and uh, there may may or may not may need to be a few tweaks. But it's obviously a professional policy that reflects the spirit of all the things that I'd asked for. And the same thing under the uh, the new policy for pest management. But I, I do have a couple of questions um, under the mosquito. 2.120, it says adulticiding, which is the spraying, shall commence on May 15th. And when we met with the, uh, the pesticide rep, they recommended July for a start date of adulticiding for several good reasons. The first one is that we start uh, having a resistance um, in the mosquito population if we over-pesticide. Um, and two, that from a disease standpoint, that uh, we're really not looking at West Nile that early in the season, it comes later in the season. And I imagine you must have had a good a good reason to start spraying this early, um, but I, I didn't know what it was. Well, the, uh, after talking to him again, he, he just advised this as a good generic policy to have. Uh, just to give yourself a couple of weeks in case you have an onset of warm weather uh, sooner than expected. Um, just for lack of any other extenuating circumstance, that would be the schedule. Okay. It seemed like there were, you had in here that there were some, with extenuating circumstances, you could use different guidelines. And, it, and I guess I would prefer that we use a more conservative approach, given the resistance that is uh, rapidly accruing in the mosquito population from a service spraying, that we would start with a later date. And then if there were extenuating circumstances, like, like rain and, and warmer weather, or West Nile outbreak early, CDC recommendations, et cetera, that we could start it earlier. Um, but I, I'd be uncomfortable us doing that up front. Um, of course, keep in mind, this is not an ordinance. It's a policy and can be changed at any board meeting. Um, so change that for June 1st? June 1st? The, what I heard from him, and I understand you may have had a subsequent conversation, was July um, as a gen generic starting point for the adult deciding program. And so if, if there aren't any other, and since I, you've had subsequent conversations that I wasn't uh, part of, I'm, I'm going to lean towards what he originally had, and had advised us. And, and that seems to fit with what CDC guidelines are as well. Um, there, are, there are step up uh, responses to if you find West Nile in, uh, in birds, et cetera, that you should start your programs earlier. But it's all based on, uh, on empirical data as opposed to, uh, you know, just spraying this from a nuisance standpoint. Um, under the public e education component 2.6, um, it talks about during the month of July that we would start uh, the public education component and, and reducing uh, the site. Um, and everything, again, from the CDC says that that really should be done in the spring because you, what you're trying to do is reduce the source of, uh, uh, of these breeding sites early before they, uh, before they happen. So just in general, I'd like us to look at starting that public education process much earlier than, than the actual time. In other words, if we wait until July, which is when West Nile typically occurs, uh, we would, uh, in, in essence, be too late. And again, what the CDC says is, the uh, source reduction is the most efficient way to reduce uh, mosquitoes um, and personal protection, which is another component to public education, is the most effective way for individuals to prevent uh, West Nile. Under the no spray request, um, which is under 2.5, I, I appreciate that this codifies 
the current situation where we have opting out for medical reasons and, and wanted just to understand um, what operational difficulties there might be if individuals want to opt out um, who may or may not have a American Medical Association approved reason for doing so. There's some people who are, are, are gaining increasingly concerned about the, the use of pesticides, <laughs> et cetera. Um, and for example, would there be any operational difficulties as other communities do to just say that from their property line, if I'm driving down Main Street and um, I don't want you to spray at my property, would there be significant operational difficulties in, in doing so? And under that no spray request, I think we probably want to put something in there that's specific, and, and this was certainly the case of our motion, that in cases of public emergency, which would include a West Nile outbreak, that the our rights to spray would uh, outweigh the individual's request um, from, a, uh, from a no spray standpoint. And, and I think that should just be part of that, um, it, just so it would overly comprehensive. And so you want to take this thing back and rewrite it? Yeah. Or, thank you. To so it. we'll not do anything to it about it. Could, could I request that Mr. Devlin contact me because I have some additional changes that I think legally need to be put in here that will put us in violation of privacy laws? Y'all so get together and get it taken care of. But, but I don't think it's a major redo. It's an outstanding uh, first step. Well, let's let him go ahead and get it redone and meet your specifications, okay? Sounds good, Mr. Mayor. What's next? All right, let's go down to Ms. Boyd with the... Uh, the bags, I believe. Um, I opened up today at 3 o'clock. Um, Jack Cole got the little bit. Well, spent. So, this is the reason why, uh, not only the reason why, we'll be saving $41,000 with the gold jet for the 1.5 mil. That's a difference within the Six point a two point mill and the one point five mill. And that's the difference. Okay. Um, it's just a bit sheet that I'm giving to you all. One of the figures I have them right here, man. So you're suggesting we go to the one point five mill at four dollars and twenty nine cents per <coughs> roll. Roll is that right? Well, exactly. And the reason being because we can save. We'll be saving forty one thousand. $600. Okay. Good. And somebody asked for this to be taken off the consent agenda. And the, do they have the questions? My, my request to take it off the consent agenda was at the time of the consent agenda, we didn't have the bid information. And right. I was uncomfortable approving a bid okay. that I hadn't seen yet. Okay. All right. So would you make the motion that we accept? Just, how does this compare to the three meal bag bid? Oh, no, we don't have a three meal bag. We have two point. Two. Two two point mill. Mill. Yeah. And they're both on here. I sent a bid out for each one of a 1.5, and on there, there's a 2.0 mill. It's the three mill sleep is what the two oh, mill bag roll has. Okay. 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 Do we have a motion? Just a point of clarification is, is was this going to come out of the 2005 budget, or was it going to come out of the 2006 budget, and do we need to make any adjustments if we do it earlier? Looking at my budget as of eight. 2005, I have enough in my budget, remaining budget now to get them. So would would we then do some type of, would we then not need to order the same number for 2006 if we pull exactly, this out? Exactly. Okay. Um, and so I have $129,535.10 in my remaining budget as of 8, 2005. It's going to cost one thousand one hundred twenty-seven thousand nine hundred and twenty dollars so that's uh, it's in there. Um, and again, the, the reason we were going from the 2.0 mil to the 1.5 is because the basically we were able to save the, the additional money. Many of us on the board have received these bags in advance exactly. and have, have uh, been trialing them out. Yes. Um, I would not say they are as good as the uh, 2.0, but they are. They have uh, they have met. I have a bag full of newspapers, and I think that's adequate. 
Uh, uh, we have been giving them out to the departments uh, since we started out delivering them. We gave out, we ordered 366 uh, rolls of bags and we're just about out of them. Okay. And nothing that we're doing tonight is going to change the current distribution method that we, that no, we have? No, and not at this time. Okay. We'll be delivering out on the weekend for <coughs> most of the people at home. And then I'd like to make the motion that we approve uh, the bid uh, from Jadcore Plastics at 4.92 a roll for the 1.5 mil garbage bags. And what was the number that you said we were ordering? Uh, we will be ordering this one more. Uh, we're going to be ordering basically 13,000 for October and 13,000 for April, which is, uh, let's see, it's 26,000 $26, uh, bags. I have it here. And that's 1,352,000 bags. 52 on a roll. Were we proposing to order all 26,000 now or just the 13,000? I would we I would prefer to go ahead and order them all now since I have all the money. We normally order, order them all at that time. Okay. Well, Clay will stagger delivery, will they not? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. Do we have a motion to, to accept the low bid on the bags? I think Matt already made that. Second. We have a motion with a second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you very much. This brings us down to the city clerk and uh, the hiring. <laughs> oh, excuse me, Summer. Yo, that's fine. Just that's advantage, disadvantage for being way down there on the far end. Or just call for the no votes and you can okay, see. Okay, all right. We got high. one no vote. That's the reason we asked for hands to go up so we can see. You still got to call for the Yeah, I, I, I realize that. Yeah. Uh, sometime. City clerk. Let's wake everybody up. Uh, this uh, was taken off the consent agenda for the hiring of uh, Ms. Taylor, I guess. Is that right? I yes, think sir. Mr. I, Perkins I, raised that issue. Yes, right, sir. Mr. Perkins. Mr. Mayor, I move that this matter be deferred uh, for consideration at our recess meeting on Monday, September the 12th, 2005. Okay. Do we have a second, second. to that? Was there second. A second. We have a motion with a second that this matter be deferred <coughs> until the recess meeting. All those in favor, please raise your hands. All those opposed, raise your hands. Thank you. This brings it down to the uh, engineering department. First thing on his agenda is the approval of the takeover agreement for well number eight. You will recall that uh, the contractor that was awarded the contract for well number eight has defaulted on his loan or on his uh, contract. We have turned it over to the bonding company. This takeover agreement is between the city and the bonding company to ensure that that work is uh, sufficiently done. And uh, Mr. Favor and the consultant engineers have looked it over. There are some things in, in the bowl type that we changed or added to this, uh, the bulk of which is on the third page under item nine, which is a list of claims that we are aware of but the actual amounts can't be determined until we agree to agree on the contract. And those items would be uh, due for Hemphill Construction Company, who has the other two contracts that's ongoing at the same time, well number eight, I mean, uh, filter number seven and uh, booster station number two. They will have some additional uh, costs in having to come back to, to that after the completion of the well. Legal fees uh, are due to the past and the current city attorney's engineering fees, as well as interest accumulated on the state revolving loans. We have to agree on this so we can uh, basically stop the clock on those items and tell the funding company what the, the numbers are. They, in turn, are um, suggesting that there will be some additional funds due to them from us because of delays in getting the contract done. And, price has gone up on their, their subcontract. 
but we do have to agree to agree on this before we can get those numbers and, and finalize this agreement. Mr. Faber has, I think, some concerns about that that he might want to share with you. Well, I've just been notified by the attorney for the insurance company putting on us, us on notice that if there's any delays that are attributable to the city that, that we would be held responsible for these delays. Now, it's not it's not clear what delays he's referring to or what kind of money we're talking about, but uh, I just got this letter uh, last week. But you still recommend approval? Of well, I, I, I recommend it, but I, I reviewed the contract you know, and made the changes that I Mr. felt were necessary. Mr. Mayor Board, I would uh, move approval of the agreement between the city and the bonding company relative to the so-called takeover agreement for well number eight uh, and uh, correspondingly a stop work order be issued on filter number seven booster station number two until such time as well number eight is completed tested accepted etc do we have a second to the motion second we have a motion with a second any further discussion all those in favor of the motion please raise your hands all those opposed raise your hands it passes. Thank you. The second item is is basically the discussion of the retaining wall on South Jackson Street between Hogan and Old Street School. It is is uh, in the process of failing. It is shifted out toward the street to about eight inches. We uh, we feel like that it should, the best interest of the safety of, of everyone, we should tear that wall out and replace it. Um, I talked with the mayor about the possibilities of how to do this, and what one one scenario came up was that we have an ongoing contract to do the downtown sidewalks. We have uh, done basically all but the west end of the of the city. We have the south side of that west end between Washington, just west of Washington. The south side is in much worse shape than the north side. And what I would recommend that we consider is to go ahead and do the south side and change order out the north side and, and have that money put toward the retaining wall. And then at a later date, the city, we could come back and redo the south side with possibly with our own forces or at a later date with other contract. The uh, price for the retaining wall by itself was $37,223 with the change order that I'm talking about where we delete the north side of that short block there from uh, Washington or Douglas Connor to the west end of the city on Main Street. Uh, we can get the sidewalk deleted, the retaining wall added for an additional $13,360 and have it done within two to three weeks. Well, I'm not familiar with the retaining wall that he's referring to. It's about to collapse. It's near one of our schools. It's on, right across from Northland Cable on the east side of North Jackson, South Jackson. Uh, we can't do this through force account completely? Our own force? The retaining wall? Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it because it is a safety issue as far as the, the, the angle of the pros of the soil and, and uh, we need to uh, special forms that we don't have in order to get in there and do those uh, retaining walls and form it up on both sides. We could do the uh, uh, sidewalk on the north side of Main Street, Force County. Mr. Mayor, uh, I certainly appreciate the, um, the recommendation coming from the city engineer, but it would look very uniform if we allowed the uh, sidewalk on the north side to be done by the same contractor. That area is going to be heavily travel in my opinion uh, because we're going to be having the new circuit court annex um, <coughs> at that location so you have citizens and other persons walking back from the courthouse area down to the circuit court annex referred to as the, the county justice center I would prefer uh, keeping that looking in a very similar manner as the other sidewalks that have been done down uh, town so I would like to ask our budget chairperson um, do we have the, the funds that we can expand uh, to do the sidewalk the 37,000 without disturbing the funds for uh, the downtown sidewalk 
uh, and of course the prior board did stress urgency to this retaining wall. Nothing had, had been has been done to it, but I would prefer uh, 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 having the north side uh, that. Uh, Main Street done just like the south side and then identifying funds if they are available. And I would like to ask the chairman uh, just real quickly, Mr. Cox, do you think that those funds are available if the board decides to utilize this as a priority? As, as I understand, the downtown sidewalk um, had been funded and, and fully budgeted. Um, so the, the funds are there to complete the sidewalk project. Um, and, and then for the retaining wall itself, um, the the issue is is that it isn't specifically budgeted for. Are there are there opportunities for us to find unused funds in the 2005 budget? Yes. Would we be in essence pulling out money that we plan to roll into 2006? That's that's the issue. Um, but if it's if it's an assessment of this is posing an imminent danger, I don't see how we can avoid not fixing the uh, the retaining wall and, and I'll have to rely on your your expertise on that. Yes. Would I like to have the money? Uh, <laughs> yes. Well, we looked at the north side uh, sidewalk and it's really not in that bad shape. As a matter of fact, when I first became the mayor, there was some question whether the money was even approved to do uh, that particular part of the sidewalks. The question was there that, uh, that if maybe that wasn't money was there so we found out that money was approved for that and that uh, knowing that this retaining wall is a, an urgent situation <coughs> that we were wondering if we would get the same company to do the retaining wall but forego the north side sidewalk and apply those monies uh, towards the retaining wall so that we could get into the retaining wall and get it completed for uh, what was that figure? Thirteen thousand dollars, roughly. Uh, yes, difference. Thirteen thousand three hundred sixty dollars. And if you look at the, the north side sidewalk, it's in pretty good shape. As a matter of fact, I thought the south end looked pretty good until Bill tried to convince me and convince me that's a, that's a really very thinly cast. If you see what's very coming thin. up up there, very thin. And, and I agree. I, I would like to see the whole downtown done uniformly, and uh, right. and this this could wait till the next meeting if you want to look at the numbers. Uh, I think all of y'all go see the South Jackson Street Wall as it's coming off now. <coughs> if, you, if you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. And I, did I not hear someone earlier today saying, "Can we get the kids walk to school?" <laughs> if you not walk by that wall, that wall collapse on them, then that'd be a, a poor judgment. <coughs> I mean that wall needs attention now because it's tilting at uh, what? The top of it's displaced about 10 to 12 inches out. Is it becoming increasingly displaced? Yes, yes sir. It's, it's slowly, like that it's slowly while. getting bigger. No, it's getting worse and worse. And, and if we get additional well, range. Uh, we need, of course, to fix it, but we also need to complete the sidewalk project just like we had planned. So let's just do it. Well, if you leave my sweep accounts along, we might be able to come up with the money. <laughs> well, if we never get them set up according to law, we will. <laughs> what would be the board's pleasure? My pleasure is to con uh, uh, complete the sidewalks as planned and uh, have an additional appropriation for the, um, <coughs> the wall on South Jackson. That's my uh, pleasure. Is that a motion? So moved, Mr. Mayor. Second. And we have a motion to second that we complete the sidewalk project and do the set the retaining wall separately. We have that in form of a motion. We have any discussion further of that. Can we add that as a change order to the concrete sidewalk? Yes. Yeah. I mean, would that be part of the motion? That'd be part of the motion to add that as a change order to the contract. All those in favor of the motion, please uh, raise your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All those opposed, raise your hand. It passes uh, unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we're down to the discussion termination contract for the frontage roads. Yes, sir. I was asked by the mayor early, early on that to, to see what we could do as far as terminating the contract for the frontage road that was going to be in front of the, the, the site at that time for the municipal complex out on Highway 25 bypass. I contracted, contacted the contractors 
APAC of Mississippi. They uh, were very cooperative, I might say. And uh, the work done to date is what they were asking for, to be reimbursed, which is very logical uh, reimbursement. Their work total is $39,521, which included uh, some excavation work, clearing and grubbing, and uh, some base prep. The, uh, and some, and $8,500 worth of pipe. So technically, for us to cancel that contract would cost us out of pocket $39,521, but we would gain uh, $8,500 worth of pipe that we could use starting next week. I mean, it's just the pipe that we buy on a regular basis, so it would not be wasted. Need that I give an explanation why I ask them to stop? No. 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 Yeah. No. So, we, I mean, there's no reason to go to take a road to nowhere. Did We're not building a municipal complex out there. Was there any, uh, I'm trying to get back in my mind, any type of agreement with the other group that bought property out there? Uh, relative to the frontage road, didn't they contribute? There, there is, and they contributed about, I think, $24,000, which we have received. Uh, and it just so happens that their property fronts right where the entrance is off of the highway to their property. So uh, even if it cost us a small amount of money to, say, complete that particular pavement issue right there for to their properties, uh, we'll still extremely well ahead. Is that not right, Bill? That's correct. Mr. Mayor, I move that we terminate the French Road contract. Second. We have a motion to second. We terminate the contract. Any further discussion? There is no legal problem with the other property owner. I don't know. We haven't asked. This is before me. I can't see that they would uh, want us to build this entire road. I don't have a problem with us using them either get refund refund their monies twenty four thousand since we have not uh, uh, paid this or uh, go ahead and say do this part to their place which is right there which may we, cost more than twenty four thousand dollars could well do that which they may or may not even want though that's great but I think they should have a conversation with them uh, we're in process having conversation on that, are we not, Mr. Poole? That uh, we're at a point where we don't know if they were even dated what they were supposed to be. This is uh, an issue which we're uh, in talking, see if you could enter this conversation. Uh, yes, sir. Board, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. It, what you're telling me is that the proposal, what you're saying is to use city employees and city material and equipment to construct no a, a no road no okay. no well, is that it? the people that are in question they contributed uh, twenty four thousand dollars for this road to be paid okay mm -hmm. it just so happens that uh, uh, the highways here and the exit right right here is like this and this road was going to come all the way down this way right here and their acreage that they bought is right here Mm -hmm. uh, the majority expense is all the way down through here. This is not that big of a deal. Am I not right, Bill? That's Even correct. if we had to uh, pay, we'll do $24,000 worth of paving, or we'll give their money back to them, let them do whatever they want to. We were building 1,000 feet of road. They were, this is the part that we saved on was this entire length down there. It went nowhere. Well, I, I wasn't privy to this agreement. I don't know what went on when they bought this property. Did they buy this property with our board? Wasn't even privy to it. It was kind of a, an arrangement made <clears throat> that if the board approved it after the agreement was done. I, I don't feel I have enough information to adequately advise the board, and there's some legal issues involved. If you're talking about taking their money, we're going to give it back to them. Now the, I know, but you were talking about taking their money, $24,000, some odd dollars. For some reason or other, there was an agreement before the board even approved it. Mr. But, yes. I, I'll modify that motion that we motion to terminate the contract subject to legal review and, and approval by our city attorney. Will that work? Do we have a second to that motion? I okay. second. We got a motion with a second. I think all of you have heard the discussion about it. 
Uh, all in favor, please raise your hand. All those opposed, raise your hand. We have two opposed, we have four, five for it. <coughs> the next item is also a question on, on South 25 on the bypass. The Ashford family, uh, which Mr. Mr. is here, have, uh, are in the process of developing a hotel slash, uh, hotel slash convention center south of uh, the industrial park uh, property. Matter of fact, it's about a quarter mile south of there. And they have not got access from their property to Highway 25 via on one of these crossovers. And what has happened is that normally in the city areas or the urban areas, the highway department, when building a four lane highway, put the crossovers, which is the access to the property on both sides at 880 linear feet apart. Anything outside the city limits is eight is uh, 1,760 linear feet apart, is or the rural spacing as they call it. Uh, when this project was started, Mr. Ashford's property it was in the county, and it was not part of the city limits. They based their spacing and their their uh, negotiations with the property owners for the, the property and the right of way on the. In his case, on the rural limits, which was at that time outside the city limits. Since then, we've annexed them. They are now inside the city limits, but still have crossovers at 1,870 feet apart, which do not correspond to his property. And what he is requesting, and we have to request it from MDOT, is to allow. Uh, for us to request the urban spacing for the crossovers, which would allow him to have, uh, and anyone else in his situation, to uh, have a crossover at 880 feet apart. Which, in that case, what it boils down to is we'd have more crossovers in the city limits than we have now because of the increased uh, number of them due to the spacing. We have to request that of MDOT, and I think in this case they will grant it since they know that we got caught and he got caught in the middle of an annexation. Uh, as to the who's responsible for building the cross the access in the crossover, uh, I, I'm of the opinion it's going to be the property owner. Um, so we're not asking you to spend any money. We're asking your permission for the city to. Uh, Request of MDOT that the urban spacing be approved. And now, are they not agreeable the, to this? They they, are, I mean, they are, appear to be uh, agreeable their with conversation this. is that they are agreeable with this. It's just a matter of fact of getting That's something right. from this board. And Mr. Webb, you and a, you, you're recommending that we do this, right? Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor, I move that uh, we. Um, a request of uh, Mississippi Department of Transportation to grant the urban crossover spacing on New Highway 25 regarding this property in question. Second. second the motion. We have a motion with a second. All those in favor, please raise your hands. It goes by unanimously. Thank you for being patient with us. Right. Thank you. That's all I have. Uh, this brings us down to executive session for discussing potential litigation regarding property acquisition. Discussion of potential litigation regarding assessed taxes and employee grievance. Mr. Mayor, I move we uh, go into closed session to determine the need for executive sessions. Uh, we have a motion. George, don't leave. I've got something for you to do tomorrow. We do this after a five minute break so we can clear up the camera. Uh, we'll take a five minute break. George.